Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, I suppose. Um, this is the PIDB's second virtual meeting, and we're happy to have all of you join us for this important event. Uh, first, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping matters. Um, if you have a question, uh, please email it to PIDB at NARA.gov. Uh, we have staff monitoring this address, and there'll be time for questions toward the end of the meeting. If we are unable to get to your questions on air, like our meeting in June, uh, we promise to address the questions and post our responses on our blog, Transforming Classification. So we've largely been virtual over the summer, um, but we've been quite busy. We welcomed our newest member, former Congressman Trey Dowdy. Uh, John Tierney testified before the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and provided the board's view on declassification reform and the bipartisan 2020 Declassification Reform Act bill, co-sponsored by one of our speakers today, Senator Ron Wyden. And we met virtually to discuss our ideas for 2021, something we'll talk about in more detail today. And we also talked about how we follow up on the report we issued earlier this year. We have an ambitious agenda today, so let's get started with our first guest speaker. I'm pleased to welcome the Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, back to speak to all of us. David was appointed by President Obama and then confirmed by the Senate on November 6, 2009. Before becoming the Archivist of the United States, he served as the Director of the New York Public Library, the largest public library system in the world. He is an advocate and ally for open government and government transparency. Over the last 11 years, he has led and modernized the National Archives. Among his accomplishment, accomplishments, he eliminated a backlog of over 400 million records awaiting declassification review. He oversaw the declassification and public release of over 40,000 documents that were previously withheld in the John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Collection. He transformed the National Archives by fostering a culture of openness, transparency, and innovation to improve public access to government records. Uh, he's developed a citizen archivist program that allows users to provide description information to digitize archival images, making it easier for all of us to discover and use them. And he issued a, man a directive on managing government records with the director of the Office of Management and Budget, establishing requirements and metrics to help federal agencies modernize their own records management practices and processes. And most importantly, he's in the PIDB corner. We deeply appreciate his support. Not only has he allowed us to borrow and use his staff for our work, he's also served as a willing partner in our work, making time to answer our questions, brainstorm ideas, and provide an archivist and librarian perspective with us. So without further ado, I will welcome David to the meeting. Thank you, Alyssa. Good afternoon. Normally, I'd welcome you to my house in the McGowan Theater here at the National Archives in Washington. Today, however, I'm welcoming you to my office due to the COVID-19 national emergency. I'm joining you through our WebEx video platform and on the National Archives YouTube channel. With our buildings closed to the public and much of our staff performing their work remotely, our staff here in Washington, D.C. and in facilities around the nation are, are continuing to serve the American people. Our staff are assisting veterans and their families claim benefits, help federal agencies with their records responsibilities, and responding to reach, researcher requests. We continue to add and update descriptions in the National Archives online catalog, enhancing and improving access to our records. Since March, our staff has added over 865,000 descriptions to the National Archives catalog, and they've added over 10 million digitized images to the catalog. In August, we launched the Presidential Library's Explorer. It complements the Record Group Explorer that we deployed in late 2019. The next generation digital finding aids that also offer users a visualization tool to help them find digitized images by collection or record group. They include textual records, audio and visual video files, photographs, and art artifacts. Our staff developed interactive programming and created online exhibits to help our nation celebrate the centennial of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, giving women the right to vote. As the presidential election season enters its final month, our Federal Register staff is busy preparing for their role in the Electoral College process. This work is important and meets three goals in our strategic plan to make access happen, connect with our customers, and maximize our value to the nation. I commend our staff for their work, especially during this challenging time. With all this important work continuing during the pandemic, I'm pleased to speak at this virtual public meeting of the Public Information Declassification Board. I'd like to thank PIDIB for their work during this difficult year. Despite the pandemic, they published an important report to the President, Modernization of the U.S. National Security Classification and Declassification System in June, 
bringing attention to an unheralded issue that is nevertheless critical in the digital age we now live and work. Their report was intended to inspire the government to think differently about policies and practices that may have worked well in the previous era, but are no longer effective in this digital age. Just as we at the National Archives did in developing a new model for electronic records management that includes entirely new processes and policies. Earlier this month, I watched PIDA member John Tierney testify before the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence about the recommendations in this report. His testimony and their report are compelling and worthy of discussion. The issue of de declassification is of concern to the National Archives. Through the National, through the National Declassification Center, our staff processes millions of pages of classified records each year for declassification to make them available to the public. This work requires the participation of agency partners who have equity in the information contained in the records. In that sense, the NDC is already taking a federated approach as agencies review their information for declassification, taking their cue from NDC staff on records that need their review. The NDC prioritizing the re review of records that our researchers want to see through in our indexing on demand program. Through this process, driven by researchers this year, the NDC has released intelligence records from the Chief of Naval Operations during the Korean War, Department of the State records related to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization during the Carter Administration, and records relating to the U.S.-Canada International Joint Commission, Department of the Navy records and motion picture records relating to nuclear testing in the Pacific, conversations from the Nixon White House tapes, and motion pictures related to the development of the Polaris weapons system. It's important, though, to recognize that challenges lie ahead with the growth of digital records. Our mission is to drive openness, cultivate public participation in government, and strengthen our nation's democracy through public access to high-value government records. The National Archives and the NDC will be an active participant in discussions seeking new solutions to improve declassification processes for electronic records. And we look forward to working cooperatively with other government agencies to harness use of advanced technologies and tools necessary to aid archival processing and declassification review. Thank you for your work on behalf of the American people, and I look forward to your continuing interest and engagement in seeking solutions to modernize the classification and declassification system. Thank you, David. Good afternoon. I'm Mark A. Bradley, the Director of the Information Security Oversight Office here at the National Archives. I also serve as the Executive Secretary of the Public Interest Declassification Board, and my staff is responsible for providing administrative and logistical support for the board. This time, I'd like to welcome our newest member, Trey Gowdy. Trey was appointed to a three-year term on the board on August 24, 2020, by House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. Trey is a graduate of Baylor University and the University of South Carolina School of Law. After serving as a federal and state prosecutor, Trey served four terms in Congress representing South Carolina's fourth congressional district, encompassing both Spartanburg and Greenville. While in Congress, Trey served on the Judiciary Committee, the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, among others. He also chaired the House Select Committee on events surrounding the 2012 terrorist attacks in Benghazi. Along with my staff and the other board members uh, who are present, I look forward to working with Trey as the board continues its efforts to make recommendations on how the federal government can modernize and improve the national security classification declassification system. Trey, would you like to say a, a few words to the, uh, the audience? Well, yeah, just a few, Mark. First of all, thank you for the uh, introduction. I also want to thank Minority Leader uh, Kevin McCarthy for allowing me to work alongside each of you. Uh, you are correct. I am out of elected office, but that does not mean you have to be out of public service. That can manifest itself in lots of different ways, including around issues uh, as significant as classification and declassification and access to information in an open and free society like the one that we uh, aspire to live in. Um, and I want to thank my fellow board members. I learned a lot from Alyssa and 
John and Ken, uh, as well as the staff in our first meeting. And I look forward uh, to working uh, with each of you over the pendency of the time for which I've been appointed. It's now my pleasure uh, to introduce um, and welcome uh, Senator Ron Wyden. I will introduce him. Uh, he's incredibly busy, so he may not have joined us yet, but I will introduce him in anticipation of his joining us. Uh, Senator Wyden was first elected to the United States Senate in 1996 and has been at the forefront of the fight against unnecessary classification for over two decades. He, along with Senator Jerry Moran of Kansas, co-authored the Bipartisan Declassification Reform Act of 2020. Uh, Senator Wyden is largely responsible for the existence of the PIDB, having taken a leadership role in extending the board's mandate, expanding its authorities, and ensuring that it is funded. Senator Wyden has been a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee since 2001. He has fought numerous declassification battles on behalf of the American people, and those battles, to name a few, include public access to the top-line intelligence budget, reports on the 9-11 attack, and the Iraq War. He's also been an opponent of secret law and fought for the public to gain access to important legal opinions that they otherwise would not have had access to. Senator Wyden's efforts in the classification and declassification realms go back uh, some 20 years to his work with then-Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan. His efforts also include the Bipartisan Declassification Reform Act, the aforementioned with Senator Jerry Moran from Kansas. Uh, Senator Wyden, uh, welcome, and we look forward to your remarks. Has he joined us? I will say in his defense, uh, we are uh, shockingly running ahead of schedule, and I don't think he is scheduled to join us uh, just yet, uh, but at least the introduction's out of the way um, when he does come. <laughs> Alyssa, do you want to uh, keep going? Well, so it may, it may actually be good to cover. Um, so we are so pleased to have uh, Trey Gowdy uh, with us to, to, to uh, actually help fill out the board. And that has been a, a good progress over the summer. Um, we've actually had a lot of discussions also about what the board does next. So obviously uh, the board issued our report uh, earlier this year. Uh, and one of the things that we've been doing over the course of the summer is thinking about how we follow up. So uh, we will be talking a little bit about that um, as we go forward, uh, thinking about how we make sure that people understand the challenges that we're seeing in the declassification realm um, and what we can potentially do about it uh, as a government uh, and things that just look like good government, uh, which is why we want to actually go into a little bit more on the details of the report. Um, we're also thinking a lot about how we just do more education on what classification and declassification looks like. Uh, and we think that that is something actually that came out of our last meeting, that we realized that there's actually a fair amount of work to be done in that space um, on prioritization questions and also just what process looks like. So we're going to be talking about more about that after, um, after uh, Senator Wyden joins us. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, it, while we wait for him, um, we also um, had one of our members, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, John Tierney, testify in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, so we might do a little bit of a preview of um, some of the discussion that we had there, um, which actually might lead well into uh, to Senator Wyden's testimony as well. So, John, do you want to do you want to give a little bit of a, a recap of, of the testimony? You're praying that I say yes. Since we're, uh, we're running ahead of schedule for that, <laughs> a simple no would just send things spiraling down with it on a, another platform. Now, look, I was happy to represent the Public Interest Declassification Board and testify in front of the Senate Select uh, Committee on Intelligence this last, just last month, as a matter of fact. Um, in the new year coming up, uh, I think it's going to be really important that we continue at the advocacy uh, for our uh, plan, uh, that we educate policymakers and senior leaders in the executive branch members of Congress and their staffs and the public on just how important it is to actually modernize the classification declassification system. It's important for our democracy, uh, but it's also essential for our national security. Uh, it's critically important that the government establish a senior level executive age. I spoke uh, a great deal about that at the hearing and I want to add a little more. We need an executive age and a senior level person to oversee and implement any meaningful classification 
and declassification reform. It's going to take sustained leadership, uh, essentially, and that's going to be instrumental in driving any change that's necessary to bring the classification and declassification system into this century. Uh, that executive agent would have the authority to oversee implementation of new policies and processes across the agencies. That's a coordination role that includes developing specific classification and declassification guidance. Uh, it can be used across the agencies to make decisions even more precisely. It'll have the authority to direct and coordinate research into advanced technology solutions. And it'll ensure the interoperability across the federated enterprise system and have the authority to coordinate technological uh, acquisitions and be able to be responsible for progress and answerable to the president. So I think that's one of the critical things, Alyssa, is that somebody uh, has to be a person with enough credibility and authority uh, ingrained uh, that people will listen to them. And an individual who answers directly to the president and who has that authority is going to be able to take all of those agencies and get them to work cooperatively uh, right across the spectrum on that. Uh, it's critical to the security of the nation. And technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning, they're revolutionizing operations and missions, and it has to be used to revolutionize the management of the classified data. Uh, there are specific tools and technology solutions that exist now at various agencies uh, for other purposes. And we need to allow those agencies to share the acquisition and the advanced technologies and the technical expertise it's going to take for the system going forward. This integrated federated systems approach is going to be what ensures interoperability, what ensures and allows for the effective use of advanced technologies to support the classification, declassification system, and it's going to lead to solutions for the declassifying large volumes of the digital data. So that's essentially, I think, enough to uh, get you started on that, Alyssa, and I spoke as slowly as I could to eat up as much time as I could. <laughs> oh, no, we don't, we're not trying to eat up time. We actually have a lot to talk about in that area. You know, I, I think actually one of the things I was sort of struck by um, that the committee was considering that hopefully we'll hear from Senator Wyden on as well um, was the question of uh, executive agent um, and who actually should be responsible uh, for exactly those kinds of actions. And I think we have thought a lot about, as a board, about who the right entity would be. Um, and I know Senator Wyden specifically uh, focused on our recommendation that it be the, uh, the DNI, uh, the Director of National Intelligence. Um, and I, I guess, uh, sort of, again, in anticipation of Senator Wyden, it might be good to talk a little bit about um, that recommendation, because I think we did, you did get a lot of questions on that piece. Um, and, and I think we have actually talked a fair amount about that um, at the board level, about why um, the DNI makes the most sense. Um, and it was really something that we considered a fair amount. Um, we, you know, we, th we thought about the, the kind of experience the DNI had, uh, and really the fact that the DNI's role was to integrate the agencies and organizations of the intelligence community uh, in a way that would help support a mission. Um, I think the, 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 my sense from the, the testimony, um, from the point that you made very effectively in the testimony was, Yes, there are lots of, of organizations um, that have classified information that are not in the intelligence community, but the ODNI actually plays a role uh, with those organizations as well. Uh, and it's just having a leader who can oversee processes and practices um, and someone, as you said, um, who is at the top level, part of the conversations already, um, is, a, is a voice that, that people already listen, listen to, and that's just an important piece. You know, our, our sense also is just that the ODNI has the technical know-how um, and acquisition experience to, to, do, to get the machining learning programs and artificial intelligence programs that you mentioned. We really need someone who can help in exactly that area. Um, they've actually done, the ODNI has done the Intelligence Community Information Technology Enterprise, iSight, um, it's an enterprise, which is an enterprise level system that's exactly the kind of example of a federated system that we're thinking about um, in the declassification space. So it, it seems to us that that is the, the fact that ODNI has experience, um, that they really thought about how you de develop and deploy uh, information systems means that they can also uh, play an incredible role in managing declassification. Uh, and that uh, is something I think that, the, again, the, 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 the committee was very interested in, um, but also I think Senator Wyden specifically. Uh, so I think that's something that we will want to focus on. Um, and my hope is that Senator Wyden actually um, brings that, com that, that piece up um, because it is something I think that was an important recommendation for us. Well, I agree uh, on that. And, and there was a question, there's some pushback from community members who I think were uh, taking on the testimony of uh, the NDI who was a little hesitant on that. One of the questions had been, why doesn't the Information Security Oversight Office, we call them ISU, uh, you know, why don't they do it? And I think that 
is because for one thing, you know, they've done a great job and they've been nice enough to staff us uh, and they're very busy and they're committed public servants that we rely on a lot. Uh, but they also have a pile of other work to do. And, and they're responsible for president policy and oversight on government-wide classified national security information system. And I can tick off all the different executive orders uh, that do the classified national security information, national industrial security program, uh, tribal, uh, local tribal, private sector uh, entities, and control of unclassified information, all of that, plus the work that they do with the uh, PID, uh, PID uh, on that. And there are only 18 people, 18 for all of that. And they're so overtaxed right now with the personnel that they have, it would be unfair and unreasonable to expect them to take on this responsibility, but also they wouldn't be able to be very effective. But we're talking about an operation that needs the command authority to be able to get the respect of all the other agencies, to coordinate the work between all of them, uh, to go out and find technology and, and new uh, ways to deal with this. Uh, that's 18 people is not going to be able to do that. The whole National Archives, under which ISOO is, is housed, it, the whole thing only gets $360 million, which is $40 million less uh, than it had been getting over the last five years. So it does not look like this is anywhere near the type of agency that been able to do it. And, and the intelligence community, on the other hand, does have the resources, we believe, to take on the project. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, and this is this, that really was something that we covered in our report. Um, I think the other thing that was sort of striking in the testimony uh, and the, the sort of back and forth that you had during the testimony was the, the underlying question of um, the notion that ODI was going to somehow be taking charge of classification overall. And that's clearly right. not what we were proposing as a board. Uh, this is not a system where um, they then control classification for all of the agencies. This is a federated system, and uh, those, those agencies still uh, have their own processes for classification and declassification. But it's really that notion of coordinating what the process looks like across different agencies. So it's not that the ODNI then has authority for declassifying um, non-intelligence community uh, information, for example, um, but having a consistent process, um, having a, a consistent set of, of practices, having tools that can actually help on the declassification side is incredibly important. And I think um, that, that is also something that, that came up. And I think that there's that going back to the education piece that we talked a little bit about, my sense is that there's confusion uh, about how declassification processes work internally and what role this uh, the, the executive agent could play, um, in part because I, I think that there's sort of confusion over someone actually declassifying themselves um, versus creating a system that enables declassification. It's just not something that people think about in practice, um, which is certainly an area, I think, for education of, for, that we can actually help on on the education side. That, that was obviously an area of concern, and interestingly enough, as members uh, came and, and left uh, from the committee hearing, as they have to do because they have so many other obligations, and they were actually good about coming in and spending as much time as possible, that question kept arising, you know, you know are they going to be trying to decide how documents get classified within each agency? It gave us a chance to repeat it and emphasize that, no, that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about this executive agent coming in and deciding what documents get classified or declassified. It's actually coordinating the whole enterprise to do that and it's to help them get the technology and the other learning tools that are necessary to do it and all of that aspect of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I thought, um, going back to the testimony piece, which I think I would encourage people who are, if they haven't read it already, um, we actually have public testimony that is available. Um, John has public testimony that's available about the, about the PIDB um, views on this. Um, I think the... Uh, I think that the, 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 the long-term challenge for us is um, making sure that people understand um, that this is something that can be done, um, that we can make progress on, um, that, but we have to take steps on it as well. Absolutely. So I think, um, I think Senator Wyden uh, will be joining us shortly. Um, I think just on, on other issues that came up in front of the committee, uh, we obviously talked about uh, the need for it. I think that one of the things that was most compelling, John, um, just in, in, in the testimony are the, the actual stories that you gave. So the questions of what happens when we don't declassify, what happens when we, when we have a buildup of records, and what a big problem that is for government. Um, I, I actually think it might be useful if you could just talk about the, the joint staff example, for example, or some of the, the other examples that you gave of of how this actually hurts the, the government overall. Well, listen, you're coming in and out. Of, in fact, I might have to put my earphones in. You're coming in and out on the uh, audio on my system, so I'm not at all clear on what you were 
that you were even talking to me on that. Let me see if I can hook us up here. All right. Sorry about that. Well, can you hear me now, John? Me. I can. Hold on one sec. All right, let's try that. Oh, so I was just suggesting that you that one of the things I thought was really powerful in the testimony that you gave were the examples that you had about why declassification is so important, why this is such a significant problem. Um, and they, they, you just had some really interesting stories in the testimony. Uh, I don't know if you may, might make sense to just um, go over a couple of those. Uh, I think we have about three minutes before uh, Senator Wyden joins us. <laughs> I think the most compelling one was uh, the story about General Hyten. Uh, you know, and uh, his comments on the, the fact of what it does in, in the uh, national security realm, uh, the inability to get these uh, records. Of, of the other part of it was the uh, the space force, uh, with newly implemented space force. Uh, the the ranking uh, officers there uh, indicated clearly that it, it's a uh, it's not good. They're not able to share across other aspects of their own enterprise uh, and the other agencies the information that's necessary to get this off the ground. Uh, and moving forward, and it, it basically slows things down and interferes pretty dramatically uh, with their operations. And I think those were probably the two most compelling uh, quotes that we had during the testimony and comments that we, that we made on that. Uh, and I know that there are, are many, many others. I don't have you know a list in front of me right here, but I, I think it's clear. And I think people's just general experience. And I think uh, Trey Gowdy would uh, recognize this. We just our own experience in Congress or whatever. The, the system right now is clearly not understood. Uh, by many, many people in Congress, uh, and why would they if they hadn't been schooled in it? Uh, but it probably is something people have to be educated in school in so they understand how the process works. Uh, but you also don't want to get in a situation where everything is classified uh, because it's easier to classify than it is to not classify. You certainly don't get criticized for overclassifying, but you're certainly going to get uh, some flack if you don't classify something that should have been classified. So the default mechanism works uh, in, a, in a contrary way as well. Uh, so I think we, we need to have, you know, this system explained across the board uh, to members of Congress and their staff, the executive branch, and the public uh, to make sure on that. And then we have to make sure that all of our national security apparatus are within this so that it functions properly. If you have two of your highest ranked uh, security people in the military telling you that you need this, you need to have a better classification system, a declassification system, you got to take heed. That's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. Um, so I'm, I'm actually going to ask, maybe turn it over to Mark to see if uh, Senator Wyden has joined us. I'm, I'm right here and unmuted, I believe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, what, Senator. <laughs> would you like me to start? Please. Well, thank you very much. And um, First of all, I understand that you've got Congressman Gowdy involved, and Senator Moran and I are working very hard to attract more bipartisan support for the cause, and uh, we look forward to working with the congressman in that uh, particular focus, because I think all important issues you want to mobilize bipartisan support, and I think this is hugely important. I've spent 20 years working to reform this out of control mess of a classification and declassification system. And the Public Interest Declassification Board has played a very important role in this effort. And so I so appreciate your work, was very involved in the effort to get uh, your organization off the ground. And so I appreciate all of the work you're doing, and we need help on uh, the issue from the outside, help from the inside. And let me get very quickly to the point about what is broken in this mess of a system. The American people now spend more than $1.8 billion a year on a broken down, dysfunctional, wreck that really doesn't serve anybody, not the public, not the government, not national security. 
every single day, records are classified electronically. So you've got a tsunami of classified information coming in that has just completely flooded and overwhelmed an obsolete paper-based declassification system. So the system is, in effect, choking on itself. And it has been going on for years and years, and it is getting worse and worse. Here's an example of how absurd this all has become. When it comes time to declassify a document, the agencies that have to sign off do not even have the ability to communicate about it securely online. Put your arms around that one. In 2020, the agencies that we want to do heavy lifting don't even have the ability to communicate about it securely online. So what happens is people print out the documents, they put them in a bag, and drive around, presumably after they've packed a big lunch because they're going to be out there a long time if they get stuck in traffic. And they put these documents in a bag and drive around from one agency to another. What a colossal waste of taxpayer money and something that at the same time, really hard to pull all this off, it damages America's national security and our democracy. Now, is there a group that thinks that this is not a serious problem? I can't find them. Everybody agrees that this system has become a farce and has to be modernized. Lots of people, <clears throat> including the board, have been proposing technical solutions for years. And I understand that this is probably not the kind of thing people are talking about in the local coffee shop. But it is still important work that needs to be done, and there's only one thing missing. That's somebody to take responsibility, who has the expertise, who has the qualifications, and can make it happen. It is very, very apparent that that somebody Someone is the director of national intelligence. DNI is already responsible for information management, information technology, and the protection of sources and methods. The DNI is already responsible for developing uniform policies within the community and at times across the government. That's why the PIDB recommended that the DNI, a lot of acronyms here, step up and take on the leadership role. And that's what the bipartisan legislation that I've introduced with Senator Jerry Moran does. It gives the Director of National Intelligence the authorities and funding it needs to do the job. Now, some of you may have seen the Intelligence Committee's hearing last month in which the ODNI, the Director of National Intelligence, said, you know, this is a serious problem, but they just practice to say that virtually anybody else in America should be tasked with doing the job. They just did everything they could to avoid taking um, responsibility. But that's what leadership is all about. That's what Congress needs to do, is to direct that this task be implemented and that we make the judgment, because it's our decision, not the decision of the Director of National Intelligence. There is a mess on our hands, a mess on our hands with enormous national security implications, privacy implications, efficiency implications, taxpayer implications. There's bipartisan support for legislation to fix this problem. 
and you all can play a critical role. We understand that democracy depends on transparency and accountability. This generation and future generations need access to government records if they are to know their own history. But you're where the rubber meets the road. You're the ones who understand the damage caused by a broken system. You're the ones who, on behalf of the American people, can play an enormous role in pushing the government and the Congress to fix it. Now, I want finally to wrap this up by saying in a very polarized political climate, I have never once, never once suggested there is anything about this issue that is partisan. From the time Senator Moran, who is very well respected in the Senate, considered thoughtful and knowledgeable, knowledgeable about, about t- technology, when he joined me, we said, we're not going to run around and say this is a Democratic issue and a Republican issue. This is a red, white, and blue issue. We shouldn't be spending billions and billions of dollars on a system that is just completely dysfunctional. So I thank you very much for inviting me to join you in an important meeting, and I just want you to know that I believe it would be of enormous benefit if in your work, on a nonpartisan basis, you would make sure with your efforts to reach out uh, to government officials and the work that uh, you do to analyze um, ideas ends up pushing the government and the Congress to fix this system and give us a classification and declassification system that Americans can be proud of and is well worth the money. I thank you all, and uh, I understand uh, that you've got a busy program, and uh, I very much look forward um, to hearing the results. I hear that you're going to have government officials, you're going to have historians and contractors, and uh, as I uh, indicated, I'm I'm very pleased that uh, Congressman Gowdy is going to be involved, and uh, I think he can be instrumental in helping us line up uh, more Republicans on an issue that's all about red, white, and blue and has nothing to do with partisan politics. Thank you all very much. And by, by the way, yes, I will see you for the last um, five or six minutes, so I, uh, I hope that all of this came, uh, came through nonetheless. It, it did, Senator. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your elo- eloquent words. Uh, we really uh, appreciate it. Alyssa? Good. Look, yes. Thank you so much, Senator Wyden. Go, sorry, go ahead. No, please. I just said look forward to working with you. As I say, I can't see the screen. <laughs> well, well, we can still hear you if that makes you feel better. Um, so thank you so much for speaking to us and for joining the public meeting and for your remarks. Um, I think we all agree with you wholeheartedly. We think this is a good government issue, and we appreciate the fact that you've been an advocate for really considering classification and declassification reform. I think we all share your views that this is a national security issue, um, that it's a long-term question for the government that we just need to, to get our hands around um, and that we need to come up with processes on a nonpartisan basis that, um, that actually help make sure that we have records that are publicly available so that people can learn from them, uh, so that people can make sure um, we actually uh, coordinate across government and, and aren't sort of siloed because of restrictions. Uh, we really appreciate the I, opportunity. Oh, go ahead. I, I, I so appreciate your taking that approach because, you know, look, this issue is not going to be on the cover of next week's People magazine. It is not some sensationalistic kind of question. But I'll tell you, it is enormously important because these documents, as I say, they're just a tsunami of documents, and we are just making a mess out of this. So um, I thank you for your thoughtful comments. I'm going to have to have to uh, get off to another um, call, but I look forward to working with you. And we look forward to working with you too. And thank you again for uh, for inviting uh, John Tierney, one of our board members, to the uh, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence last month. Uh, we appreciated having the opportunity to testify. Very good. Thank you all. Yes, sir. Thank you. Bye, sir. Thank you, Senator.
Okay, so I think we're, we want to turn next to our thoughts for our work on 2021, some of which have actually been previewed, I think, by the Senator's comments, um, but also some of our discussions about what happened in front of the committee. Uh, so we have a couple of things that we wanted to cover, and I think what, what we will do is I will touch on a, a few of them, and then I'll turn it over to our other members um, to, so that we can hear their thoughts as well. Um, I think our sense is that some of our work is going to simply continue from this year, um, and then we have a few new projects and proposals that we are, we are working through right now. Uh, one thing I just want to flag again, um, at the end of the portion of the meeting, we will have some time for questions. So if you have questions, um, submit them by email to PIDB at NARA.gov, and we are happy to get to them as quickly as we can. Uh, and we can, uh, we can also get to them on the blog if we don't get to them during the live meeting. Um, so before we, get, we begin, I think we want to just talk about a few of the things that we've agreed to and sort of where we think we are on some of them. So going back to, uh, to, to both um, our comments earlier and Senator Wyden's comments, we really think it's important to continue advocating for the recommendations that we had in our May 2020 report to the president. Those big questions of systems um, and how those pieces fit together uh, and the, the ability of using technical approaches, for example, uh, to, to really work through declassification of a massive, massive number of records. It's something that we have to do sooner rather than later. Um, we need someone who can be an ally to help make sure that those things happen. Uh, and we really see that as, a, as something that is, is important for, um, for government to work through. Uh, and uh, the other component of that, I think, which has come up again on this call a few times already, um, is the, the component of education. Um, so one of the things that was striking, that has been striking to us throughout the process was the, 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 the lack of information that was out in the public about why this matters. And, and maybe as Senator Wyden said, um, it's not going to get you on the cover of people, um, but we do think that the question of classification and the number of records and the ability of making records public is an incredibly important one. So I think one of our goals is going to be to seek out venues, platforms, and activities that will bring attention to the problems of the antiquated or outdated classification and declassification system, but also that talks through what is classified information, how is information classified, how do we go about declassifying, declassifying it, how do we prioritize that? Uh, so that is going to be, I think, a significant chunk of our work um, in, the, in the coming period, which is really a follow-on to the report, um, but making sure um, that the public and members of Congress understand what that system looks like so that they can really fully evaluate um, solutions and long-term uh, approaches to the problem. Um, one other thing that we know we're going to be working on uh, over the next, uh, next few months we actually received a request from um, Senator Chris Murphy's office uh, to review five classified records and provide recommendations to the president on whether some or all of them can be declassified. Uh, so we intend to conduct the review in accordance with the provisions in the Public Interest Declassification Act of 2000. And that, that is something that is on our agenda. Um, we, are, uh, we do recognize that this is a strange time for everyone, uh, and we are constrained about what we can do in person because of the pandemic. Uh, so we don't know exactly what the timing will be for that process, but it is something that we have agreed to undertake as, as, a, as a board. Um, and then finally, uh, the last thing, just from a, a, a thing that we intend to do standpoint or where we want to go, um, we actually are planning on um, bringing back uh, on the report side we want to, we're going to prepare a short letter highlighting the need for modernizing the classification and declassification system um, and recommendations for solving these challenges that will be sent to the new White House after the, the inauguration, whatever, whatever party that is. Um, the goal really is to talk about this again, about how modernizing the classification and declassification system is an issue that concerns us all. Uh, we think it's critical for um, democracy and it's just the reality of having um, digital records these days. The system that Senator Wyden described of one agency um, printing out records, bringing them in person to another agency for declassification review is not one that's sustainable. It's not one that the, the, the taxpayers uh, want us to uh, engage in. We need to come up with better processes. And we think that's just an important thing from a national security standpoint. So it's, it's something that we want to highlight. And now I'm going to turn to my PIDB colleagues for their comments. So uh, John, why don't we start with you? Well, I could make this very brief, Liz, but I think you hit it all right on the head. You, you talked about the very points that, that we discussed at our meeting and we're going forward. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to be long. I'm just going to reiterate essentially what you said quickly is we need to educate. I think that's the basis of all of it, uh, to make sure people understand why it's important and what exactly we're talking about and, and what needs to be done. Uh, and then that turns into advocacy, of course, of the recommendations that we've made while we listen and keep an open mind to what others may inject as their ideas into it. It's not necessarily the case that present legislation that's filed is going to be exactly 
the end model, but I think we've got a good uh, piece out there for the base and, and work on it from that. Uh, and I think it's important that we get the next White House, you know, whether it's a second term or for initial term, uh, focused on this as well. We need their cooperation and we need them to be able to empower the executive agent and give them the type of authority it's going to take to carry this uh, throughout. So I think that's a, a lot of work uh, that will have to be done and it should keep us busy throughout uh, the better part of the year. That's great, John. Uh, Trey, I wanted to turn to you next. Well, Alyssa, this is my second meeting, and you may recall um, the advice I've given myself is that when you're new to something, you should talk last and talk the least. So I'm, go I'm going to try to stick with that. Uh, you and John touched on the two things that are foremost in my mind, which is it, it's, it's a challenge sometimes uh, to both educate and, uh, and advocate. Uh, so you have to educate first and you know, I was in I was in the House for eight years, but it was only being on the the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence where I learned anything related to classification. It's just being a regular member of Congress, you don't even undergo a background check. The election is your background check, so you don't even know what it takes to get a to get a clearance, uh, and you certainly don't understand the process. So, part of it is the you know public consciousness, um, you know, convincing the public that this is an important idea. Uh, but frankly, some of it is also convincing members of Congress that do not on a daily basis work with intelligence uh, related issues. So, Alyssa, I think you're right. Um, education um, often comes before the advocacy does. I was also struck by John's testimony before to see the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence about uh, the military leaders and their take uh, on how classification or overclassification actually can have a negative impact on our national security. So, under the kind of under the heading of, of education, I, I am personally curious the motive. If there is an overclassification, what is the motive? And I, I think there probably is a bias towards overclassification. What is the motive behind it? Is it a is it a fear of of, of of guessing wrong, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to speculate on what the motive may be, but I think we need to understand the motive if we're going to be able to, to solve it. So, all that to say, I I am in favor of the board uh, moving on this issue, of a program of education the public, um, but not overlooking the fact that many members of Congress, uh, despite having served a long time, just don't have the familiarity. Um, that they would want to have uh, with these issues because they don't bump into them on a regular basis. Well, I do think you may be a you may be a new member, and this may be only your second meeting. Um, but I think that the, you're highlighting that issue for us. Um, I think it's something that really will lead to productive work uh, in the next year. I think it's I think you're exactly right, um, and I think that it's something that we can actually make a, a, a big difference on uh, that education piece, just understanding what this looks like, which actually then I think will lead to uh, a better process down the road. So we really appreciate your thoughts on that, um, and then. Finally, I wanted to turn to, to Ken Weinstein. Um, he has served two terms on the PIDB, and this is and his second term just ended. Uh, so he's been incredibly productive and an important member for us. And we wanted to make sure he had an opportunity to provide some remarks because his insight and experience in government have been extremely helpful as we deliberate, um, as we deliberated, discussed, and report, wrote our reports to the president. Uh, and he has actually had a lot of thoughts on that, that some of the questions that um, the trade that you brought up um, on, on issues of, of overclassification and incentives and how we actually uh, get to a better result from, a, from the initial classification side. So, Ken, over to you. Okay, thanks, Liz. Appreciate the kind words and um, good to be here with everybody. I just want to start out making a couple of general comments. I think it's been, whatever, six, seven years on the group, um, on the board, and um, and just, I just want to point out how this really is a, a special group. It's, it's, a, it's a DC group, a DC entity that's like distinctly un-DC in the sense that it's nonpartisan. It's focused on problem solving, not problem making. It's all about making the government more effective, more efficient. Um, and uh, it's collegial. Um, we all like each other. We work well together. We produce unanimous reports. Um, so it's really a, um, it's it's a wonderful group doing really important work, and uh, I I feel honored to have been a part of it for these last six or seven years. Also, want to uh, give a nod to the staff. The IT staff is tremendous, as has been 
we've worked on already, um, and they do a great job of um, keeping us on the, the right path and, and supporting us and pushing the mission forward. And then lastly, just want to thank the, uh, the stakeholders, the folks who are on this call, uh, the people who, you know, for whom these, this issue is, um, um, you know, near and dear and, you know, the folks who are passionate about it because, as uh, Senator Wyden said, you know, it isn't something that's going to get on the front of People magazine, but it really is important to our democracy. So it's important that we have people who are maintaining a focus on that uh, while it's all too easy to get distracted by the, you know, the issues du jour. What, what I do, what I want to talk about here is, um, is just for just a moment or two, talk about overclassification at the front end. And that is near and dear to my heart because I was a longtime government employee and I saw sort of arcane practices by which documents became classified. Um, and it's troubling. It's really the root of the whole problem. And this is, as Senator Wyden said, this is not a political, this is not a partisan issue. Um, this is a completely bipartisan uh, concern and there's bipartisan agreement that something needs to be done about it, that too much information is being classified without reason, that too much information is classified at, at a higher level than it needs to be. And look, there are practical reasons why this happens. It's, you know, people often talk about this issue and want to go to the darkest corner of the room and suggest that overclassification is all about, you know, certain government employees wanting to hide embarrassing information. That's, you know, while that might happen on, in isolated situations, the, the root of the problem is that the incentive scheme in place doesn't reward anybody for classifying at a lower level or erring on the side of not classifying. The incentive scheme pushes a classifier to classify and to classify higher than possibly necessary. And that's just, that's been, that's inherent in our, our government system. It's been a problem that's been recognized by groups uh, that have studied this, you know, going back to the Moynihan Commission of the 1990s, there was a commission to reduce and protect government secrecy. They uh, get, made recommendations about how to try to deal with this issue. The 9-11 Commission report in the early OOs uh, addressed this issue, and then there was the Reducing Overclassification Act in 2010 that was specifically intended to address this issue, and still it persists. Um, and as we've discussed already, you know, this, this has real practical implications. It causes damage. You know, for government policymakers, it means that they don't necessarily get all the information they need to make sound policy decisions. Um, in terms of uh, security, overclassification actually encourages leaks. Seems counterintuitive, but that's the case. When information that should get out doesn't get out, that emboldens and encourages people to leak that information. And we've seen that over and over and over. Um, and, uh, and so transparency, at, transparency as to those matters that should be transparent actually discourages people from leaking things that shouldn't be transparent. Um, as John mentioned in his testimony, uh, you know, overclassification can limit innovation. It, as with the, his testimony about the Air Force leaders complaining that overclassification is limiting their ability to develop technologies, to deploy the private sector to, you know, to develop technologies that they need because overclassification of information prevents them from sharing that information with the private sector partners who are, you know, key to these efforts to develop the next generation technology we need to protect our country. Um, you know, these are all real world problems that need to be addressed. And then the question of, you know, oh, how, that's fine, Ken. We see the problem, what is the answer? That's a tough question, but the answer is, you know, we need to step back, look at this whole process and put new processes in place that do a few things. One, that don't just say, okay, something is a source of method and therefore it needs to be protected to the highest degree. We need to be, we need to distinguish between sources and methods that are, you know, super sensitive, those that are less sensitive, and those that really aren't sensitive at all, and, and classify according to that delineation. We need to be able to accept some risk in this process. This goes back to my point about the incentive scheme. We need to be able to assume that there's going to be a little bit of risk for the purpose of transparency. There's always a conflict, always will be an inherent conflict between transparency and, um, and the need to protect secrecy, but we need to accept some level of risk, and we see the consequences if we don't. So we need to sort of take on that tension, acknowledge it, and then try to build processes that help us to manage that tension. And um, look, I think um, 
uh, I'm very happy to hear the comments by everybody so far today about the importance of this issue. We need to re-energize the effort to crack this nut. It's a it's it's really a difficult one, and it's one that's all too often put at the bottom of the priority list when other crises are coming to the fore, and it's hard for the executive branch to sort of keep the eye on that. But I but I think we need to do that, and I'm hopeful that the PIDB can play a leadership role in that effort. And I appreciate the opportunity to have done so for the last seven years. So thanks very much. I just tuned out. I no longer see myself on the screen, which is a blessing, but I don't know if I've tuned out for you guys or not. No. Okay. We can still see you. We can still see okay. you, Ken. And right. even more importantly, we can still hear you. So There you go. <laughs> okay, so thanks so much for letting me say my piece, and um, thanks to everybody on this call for the good work you're doing for a very important cause. Well, and thank you, Ken, for all of the work that you've done. Uh, you've been such a such an incredible advocate on these issues, um, and particularly the, the, the uh, expertise that you've brought on the questions of, again, incentive structures, why people overclassify, um, what this looks like, and, and how we fix it, because that's really the, the hard part. It's trying to solve the practical problem. So uh, thank you for everything that you've done, uh, and we hope we can, can continue to work with you um, as, as things go forward. Thanks, uh, as do I. Uh, so I think the next thing we're going to do is uh, turn to some questions that we've gotten um, from the public, uh, and so I think that we are um, we are ready at, at this point to, um, to to look at comments that we've gotten and answer your questions. Again, uh, just to repeat for a third time, <laughs> if you have questions during the course of the meeting, um, please email pidb at nara.gov, uh, and we'll have staff monitoring that email uh, so that we can get to your questions today. Um, but we're uh, I think maybe I'll turn to to Robert, who's been taking those questions. Yes, hello. I've got some questions um, that we've been receiving. The first one is, what is the purpose of the executive agent? Well, John, why don't you, uh, why don't you take I, that you, one? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, the, um, I think this person has probably been a pretty uh, clairvoyant on that. I know it would be one of the subjects we talk about today on that. but. As I mentioned, you know, in my testimony from the Senate and, and a little earlier today when we were talking about that, uh, it's a coordination role, essentially, and we need some uh, agency that is going to provide leadership on the whole classification, declassification uh, system for developing, for implementing, and for managing the system. Um, it's not designed to control what information gets uh, classified or declassified. That's not the role. I think it's another opportunity for us to make sure that we stress that. They, this entity would not be controlling the information agencies essentially are going to classify and declassify, but it's going to lead those agencies in the way they address the declassification as an enterprise system. Uh, so they'll, this executive agent will work with an executive committee, and then together they'll design new practices on how to streamline and modernize the classification declassification system, how we can integrate advanced technologies into the process, and then how we can align them uh, across those agencies. So it's crucial to have this executive agency for reform. Uh, modernizing the system is complicated because it involves so many agencies. So it's going to require that dedicated leader who has authority and has the responsibility uh, to direct the change and get it done. Okay, very good. Um, another question that might um, allow you to touch on some points you've already discussed, but here goes. How does the PIDB recommend implementing technology to improve classification and declassification? So I, I can take that one. Um, so we really think that technology is a critical component for modernizing um, the system. Uh, we think that artificial intelligence and machine learning and advanced technologies can really do a, a significant work in the space that is not being done currently. Um, and our sense is that the DNI in particular uh, has the proven leadership abilities to coordinate new processes that might involve things like AI and machine learning. Um, and they can actually come up with solutions that help modernize the classification and declassification process to make it more efficient and effective. Um, you know, our sense right now um, from a lot of the work that we have done and we did in sort of advance of the report was that the, um, the intelligence community has had a lot of experience in thinking about these te technologies and they actually uh, have an ability to be sort of a change agent in this space um, because there are things that they're looking at for other purposes already. Uh, so for us, um, this is an area that could really benefit from that, um, from, from, from new technology. 
Um, our sense also is that DNI in particular um, has the technical expertise um, and the access to advanced technologies in place to facilitate information sharing. So getting at that exactly that problem that we discussed before, which is uh, the, the, the fact that people can't share uh, across agencies, that they actually have to carry paper. Again, that's not something that's acceptable in the long term. And we think that the DNI can really do a, a good job in thinking through what those processes look like and making sure that they have access to that all of the different agencies that have classified information have access to relevant technologies so that that doesn't happen. Um, ODNI also has experience developing, deploying, and managing secure um, multi agency cloud based enterprise systems. So if you think about iSight or um, the, the, the email system, the Secure Communications Network, JWIX. Um, the, the idea of all of those is that there are ways of actually connecting uh, the, the intelligence community um, and dealing with classified information. And the fact that they actually have the expertise in deploying those systems seems to us that, that we can use that expertise uh, for declassification um, and classification systems as well. Okay, thank you. Um... Looks like there's a follow-up question on that. Can these new technologies be used with all types of rec records, textual, still photos, films, videos, audio recordings, and electronic records? So I think actually that's one of the, the huge new areas um, for development. In fact, that may be something that's easier to do from a technology standpoint um, than it would be in in person. There's a yes, they absolutely can be, um, and I think that we are uh, those technologies are exactly the area you want to go on those things. They can they can recognize um, similarities and patterns along things like images um, in a way that is uh, that is much easier in the long term um, than actually having having human review. Um, so from a practical standpoint, we think that that is a, um, that's a, a significant area for, of opportunity, um, but it's something that someone really needs to get their hands around to make sure it is, it is all sort of different sources of, um, of information coming in, not just text. Thank you. Um, here's another one from a different direction. Why did the board not also recommend an EA for classification? Nope. Well, Mr. If I think we, if you don't mind, I'll just hit that up because we talked about that a little bit as well. Uh, the board's vision, what we had envisioned of that was that the executive agent would address the modernization of both the classification and the declassification while well, sort of an integrated process uh, that would go across the whole government, as a matter of fact. So modernization is going to lead to more accurate, precise classification and declassification uh, decisions. You know, if we reform the front end, uh, of the processes is going to support the information sharing and the security for the operations, but it's also going to reduce the volume uh, and facilitate the automation of data requiring declassification in the future. So um, the federated system assistance approach is going to support the entire life cycle of the record uh, from the point of classification, protecting uh, the use of sensitive information from the time of its inception through archiving, uh, declassification review, and the ultimate release to the public. So it's all there. Very good. Um, yet another question. Does the DNI have authority outside of the IC? I touched a little bit on this, but I think um, Trey has uh, just joined the board and he actually may have read up on this issue as well. So uh, maybe I'll, 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 Trey, if you could answer that one, that would be great. Well, I can certainly amplify what I think you have already, uh, already said, which is the DNI uh, already coordinates policy and uh, is responsible for the implementation of that policy even beyond the intelligence community. Uh, that includes uh, implementing the use of secure communications technology across the executive branch, and the, uh, and the ODNI also has a role to play in security clearances uh, across all of government. DNI policies, I believe, uh, already guide the electronic communication and sharing of classified information between the IC and non-IC civilian agencies, including, uh, by way of example, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Office of Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Trey. I, I think they, the DNI has also done some other things. Um, that, For example, they developed the first intelligence community information environment data strategy, uh, which provides a framework for applying advanced analytics and big data techniques to store, process, and manage classified information um, while protecting sensitive sources and methods. So this is a really a space that they have been in on exactly that point. 
Um, and I, I think that that's the important piece to understand. So unlike NARA and ISOO, um, that ODI really has a structure in place uh, to think about these kinds of technologies. They've been doing a lot of work in that space, um, and they're just trusted within the IC, um, which is, is is an important component, I think, of of whoever takes on this role. Okay. Um... What is a federated declassification system and how would it work? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to try to answer this one, Elizabeth, you know, without uh, using too much gibberish on, on that. But like, it, the, the intention of the federated uh, declassification system would be one that would allow agencies to share technology and applications in order to accomplish similar tasks that the agencies might have. Uh, it would require the agencies to work into a common goal and work with one another to accomplish those goals. It's also going to require that agencies develop a declassification work process and operate across the agencies where they have matching and overlapping equity interests and information. So a lot of it, as you see, is the coordination and the working together aspect of that. They're going to need comprehensive data standards that would facilitate tech, uh, technology integration and, and that would be into the declassification process and make that process more effective and efficient. It's also going to allow them to have budgets uh, that are more effective in order to be able to research and invest in and acquire the technology that's going to be such an important underlying part of all of this. Uh, and in, in essence, it'll facilitate and improve uh, and standardize uh, the declassification decisions. So that'll be a, a more precise decision, decision as a result. Uh, it will protect the information if it truly requires protection. Uh, it'll declassify the information that no longer is sensitive and uh, they can be publicly released. So that's the basis of it. And uh, coming to the end of what's been received today, will this federated system approach be too costly? Will it necessitate a wholesale reallocation of resources away from critical mission activities? Um, I'll take a crack at that one. I don't think it should. Uh, these efforts uh, can be and often are effective in not only reducing costs, but equally importantly, um, increasing efficiency. Government spending on information security, including technology acquisition, safeguarding, and IT systems uh, can be, like any other government program, uh, duplicative and um, occasionally uncoordinated. And since spending is still so agency centric um, and therefore occasionally siloed, forcing uh, agencies to coordinate work with one another, I think would be a benefit for for government uh, and for those that fund government, which would be the taxpayer. Okay, thank you very much. That's That's what's come in today. So I think that concludes our questions for today. Well, wonderful. Um, well, thank you. So I think that's the, that may be the uh, the end of our public meeting component. Um, I think uh, I think we're again happy to take additional questions. If um, if if folks have uh, questions they want to submit, um, please again feel free to submit them, and we can respond um, on our on our public blog. Um, and I, I I guess since we're coming to the end of our public meeting, uh, I want to I want to. Uh, thank all of the folks who have spoken today. So on behalf of, of the board and all of our members, uh, certainly the Archivist of the United States, um, David Ferriero, for opening our meeting today, um, Senator Ron Wyden for speaking about the 2020 Declassification Reform Act, um, and really the, the thing that we were all focused on, which is the need to reform the classification system generally. Um, and most importantly, I, I want to thank all of you for joining us today um, and for, continued, for your continued interest in reforming the classification and declassification system. We talked a lot today about um, the need for education, um, and I think everyone who is participated in our meeting today, um, everyone who has joined uh, virtually has a role to play in that space as well. Uh, so we, we recognize that um, there, are, uh, there are certainly advocates in the space on declassification that have important voices um, that we need to make sure that we amplify um, and also that can play an important role in education as well. So uh, thank you again for joining us. Please stay engaged. Um, please read and respond on our blog. Again, follow up if you have questions. Um, and I think uh, with that, I think we will close the meeting today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa.
That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Services. You may now disconnect.